I'm Ryan O'Dowd, and you're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine channel on YouTube. We're continuing the Psychic Bible by Genesis Peoridge and her collaborators. The Psychic Bible is covered by the Fair Use Clause in the United States Law because it's a religious text. Part 1-2. Introduction on the way to the garden. The psychic youth sits in a house of cards, reaches out. It is not hard. Only takes the will to do it. Only takes a small push to watch the house they have built for you collapse. To peel back the mask of the identity they gave you. And when the house falls, as it must, it is the first garden we find ourselves in, unnamed. To be awake. To be extreme. These are the apocryphal scriptures of Genesis Briar Peoridge in the Temple of Psychic Youth, a representation of an 11-year experiment, 1981 to 1992, that will be remembered as a crucial period in the development of both the rough beast that is magic and of anarchic and artistic responses to the ever-marching and ever-homogenizing process of globalization. While the story of the music of Genesis Briar Peoridge, Throbbing Gristle, and Psychic Television is relatively well known, the story of T.O.P.Y. remains a cipher, hidden behind slogans and propaganda. The activities of the temple, outside of the memories of those who were there and participated, have been obfuscated, and quite intentionally so, buried like the Dead Sea Scrolls, or perhaps as William S. Burroughs once wished for some particularly volatile and explosive fragments of his own cut-up writing, wrapped in lead and sunk to the bottom of the ocean, leaving a blank spot in the history of the progression of both modern occulture, a term the temple coined, and modern culture itself. Founded out of the rubble left by the sonic assault that Throbbing Gristle waged on the English public, Psychic TV was originally conceived as the new forum for XTG members Genesis Peoridge, along with Alex Ferguson of Alternative TV, and later, for a short time only, Peter Christofferson, later to form one half of quote-unquote Archangels of Chaos, Coil, with the late Jeff Rushton, a.k.a. Jean Balance, and occasional cameos by Mark Almond of Soft Cell. The band's original forays, notably the LPs Force the Hand of Chance and Dreams Less Sweet, under Ferguson's influence, largely drifted away from TG's pulverizing wall of force and into more pop territory, the band becoming a fully-fledged psychedelic rock outfit by the release of Allegory and Self. Set up as a propaganda device for self-directed consciousness expansion by any means necessary, Psychic TV was structured as the public face of the Temple of Psychic Youth, a wide-scale experiment in the meltdown of personal assumptions via guiltless sexuality and more formalized magical techniques derived from Austin Osmond Spare, Brian Jason, and Aleister Crowley, among others. T.O.P.Y., however, was never an explicitly magical order, drawing equally on the heritage of the radical action groups and experimental micro-societies of the 1960s, such as the Exploding Galaxy Group that Genesis had worked with in London, the Diggers of Haight-Ashbury, or the Coombe Transmissions Performance Art Collective that Genesis founded in 1969 after a series of quote-unquote flicker-induced visions and voices, later joined by Peter Christofferson and Cozy Fanny Tutti before creating Throbbing Gristle with Chris Carter. The magic of the temple wasn't the magic of the Golden Dawn, designed for the stately Victorian manor. It was magic designed for the blank-eyed, TV-flattened, prematurely abyss-dwelling youth of the late 20th century. Like the punk kids in Derek Jarman's Jubilee who have never ventured out of the council flats they were born in. Rather than high ceremony, drawing room intrigue, and exalted initiatory ritual, the focus more often than not became simple survival and defense of the individual vision from a malevolently dehumanizing culture that the Victorians and modernists, even in their most racist and reactionary moments, could never have foreseen. The temple, as it initiates, often said, was a ghost. It was and is the realization that your daydreams and fantasies, the teachers within you, are the most important teachers of all. A push in the right direction towards yourself, towards self-integrity, towards your own connection with the deep waters of spirit, a method of deprogramming instead of programming, the chapel of extreme experience. Keys to the Temple Sitting in the back of the car at age six, watching the trees on the horizon, the setting sun flickering through them, heart is infinite, moment is infinite. Two, watching strange androgynous singer on television at age 12, new world, newfound desires, yearning for something more than the human. Three, strange books with strange symbols, screaming orgasm at ceiling gives birth to self. Four, First trip with friends in the woods. Sudden sense of understanding felt in the body. This is paganism, to find the gods within oneself. Five. What do you want to do with your life? 
T.O.P. were the direct inheritance of a century's work of occult and countercultural quote-unquote science, and then some. A crust-punk laboratory where radical and in many cases previously forgotten ideas were synthesized into a way of life. The cut-up method of William S. Burroughs and Brian Jison, Jison and Ian Somerville's Dream Machine, Austin Spare's Sigil Method, Sexual Magic in the Vein of Alistair Crowley and Pascal Beverly Randolph, the otherworldly and psychedelic explorations of John D., Timothy Leary, and John C. Lilly, Count Alfred Krasbinski's general semantics, and the physical and sexual deconditioning of Wilhelm Reich, among many, many other avenues of theory and practice. Over a drink in a pub on Museum Street in London, where Crowley and Spare once whiled away lost evenings, Phil Hine, the tantric scholar and author of many of the preliminary texts on chaos magic, a school of progressive occult thought, that ran largely parallel in timeline and geographical center of development and often intertwined with the efforts of T.O.P.Y. Related a particular telling story to me. Speaking in very admiring tones of the temple and stating that, in his belief, they have still yet to be surpassed for the revolutionary approach to magic, he recounted the tale of a very serious Thelemic symposium held somewhere in the Midlands, in which a very serious discussion of the theory and practice of Crowley and sex magic was enjoined by a few T.O.P.Y. initiates, who, in the name of freedom of information, displayed a videotape of a T.O.P.Y. sex magic action, only to have the ever-so quote-unquote transgressive crowd descend into nervous, schoolboyish, giggling fits. The world of quote-unquote magic is nine times out of ten a world where people can hide their deep-set insecurity and personal damage behind illusion, constructed identities, and claims to privileged knowledge, power, or spiritual status. A gaudy carnival magic show conducted with props that have long since begun to disintegrate with age that seems to function only to distract people from the real magic that is occurring all around them in every facet of their lives, every day of their lives. While the rituals and magical techniques of the temple seem overly simplistic in comparison with the loftier Kabbalahs, tables of correspondence and secret formulae of high magic, they have one thing which high magic quite often forgets, a concrete function. The T.O.P.Y. magical system centered around its unique approach to the sigil method, as derived and modernized by the artist Austin Osmond Spare in the early years of the 20th century from earlier work by Cornelius Agrippa in the 16th. At the same time every month, in the 23rd hour of the 23rd day, each active sigilizer would create a sigil of three liquids. After careful deliberation on something that truly wanted and needed in life, each sigilizer would write in detail what they wanted to happen, thereafter anointing the paper with blood spit sexual fi- fluids and a clipping of hair. After drying, this would be placed in an envelope and placed at T.O.P.Y. World Headquarters, where it would be filed away anonymously under each sigilizer's identity number within the temple. These archives remain undisturbed at an undisclosed location somewhere in the world. Each sigilizer aimed to gain control over the one... The only thing over which control is truly possible, oneself. The apparent simplicity of the sigil of three liquids masks some pretty, some very deep processes that have been a part of the human experience since prehistorical times, acting on levels of the brain far deeper and therefore much more potent than those we are expected to use as citizens of the modern world. Central to an understanding of the T.O.P.Y. sigil method is the law of contagion as observed by James, Sir James Fraser in The Golden Bough. The assumption of, common among most quote-unquote primitive peoples that a fragment or splinter, as Peoridge says, of something can be used as a magical link to affect its source. Instead of using bits of hair, blood, or fingernail to curse or cast love spells on others, the standard vulgar view of what magic is, initiates of the temple use links to themselves to affect their own destinies. DNA forms the best magical link possible to one's own self, a perfect holographic splinter containing everything necessary to create yourself anew. Willingly put in contact with a symbolic representation of intent, a message is produced and directly sent not only to the non-conscious mind, but also to the conscious universe which one inhabits. Such is the bewildering, though incredibly effective, realm of sorcery. These are also the exact principles that the nascent science of radionics operates on. Readers are directed to the research of Duncan Laurie for an in-depth look at the directions this type of quote-unquote magic can be taken in. Regardless of any supernatural effects experienced in connection with such experiments, a deeper process was initiated. A dialogue begun between each temple initiate and their quote-unquote true will. Their core reason for existing, that the truly important aspects of life might be fully tuned into and the background static cancelled out as much as possible. Genesis Briar Peorge has often stated that the primary 
quote unquote teaching of TOPY was discipline. That is discipline in focusing on and actualizing the life one actually wants to live, regardless of social pressure or constraint. In that respect, a Quentin Crisp might be a more apt symbol of the type of quote-unquote initiate that Temple wished to produce than an Israel Regardi. Magic was never the primary goal of T.O.P.Y., though the organization is most often remembered as a magical or paramasonic order. Rather, it was one tool to be used in the formation and execution of a radically new approach to life outside the confines of the mundane. Though, if it's magic you want, then backwards, sideways, crossways, and loopwise secrets of magic are manifested throughout this text, mirroring the potential of magic to reach through time, as if time were a single fluid object to make its point known. While T.O.P.Y. conducted its decades-long ritual, Psychic Television worked overtime with a rotating cast of contributors to provide the soundtrack, forming part of an incredibly fertile, wink, if often disjointed period in the evolution of the industrial genre that Throbbing Gristle had spawned. While Coyle, Current 93, and Nurse with Wound spent most of the 1980s delving directly into the darkest and most unsavory facets of Throbbing Gristle's legacy, Psychic TV, thanks in large part to regular conception of MDMA, moved from an early focus on tribal wolf pack style declaration of war on men's sleepwalking state and into a fully psychedelic, or rather hyperdelic, Mary Prankster-esque cheerleader squad for sex, drugs, and magic. When Psychic TV toured America, late in the late 80s, they brought along a tour bus painted in full hyperdelic drag on the front of which they painted even further, slightly upping the ante on the original Mary Prankster's acid test bus. Following a near breakthrough to major chart success with Godstar, a hymn to the late Rolling Stone Brian Jones, Psychic TV, and T.O.P.Y. became early adopters and proselytizers of the English rave scene. Genesis Briar Peorge is credited with popularizing the phrase Acid House after a particularly fortuitous record shopping trip in Detroit. By 1988, the role of Genesis' primary collaborator had rotated from Alex Ferguson to electronics guru Fred Gianelli, a collaboration which led to Psychic TV's Jack the Tab techno acid beat in the near masterpiece Towards the Infinite Beat, a haunting, very personal album centered around passionate diatribes against mankind's innate need for warfare, Horror House, and Jigsaw, later to be revisited in live sets on the eaves of both wars of the Persian Gulf. In elegies for Brian Jason, Bliss, and Ian Curtis of Joy Division, who was slotted to become a full member of Psyche TV at the time of his suicide in 1980, I See Water. The entire lyric of quote-unquote Jigsaw was a combination of a backwards and forwards, a backwards, a forwards, and a combination of backwards, forwards, and whispered vocals using writings from various processian publications. Bliss, in contrast, mixed Scientology speak with the music of Jajuka. Acid House was the apex of T.O.P.Y.'s efforts, a wide-scale scene which allowed for the type of ecstatic, transcendental, and magical bliss that Brian Jason had found in Morocco in the panpipes of the master musicians of Tajuka and introduced to Brian Jones shortly before his untimely demise. Consider the 20-year arc between the release of Brian Jones Presents the Pipes of Pan at Tajuka in 1968 and the explosion of the Acid House scene in 1988. Bashir Attar, the most recent master musician, lived with Genesis and Lady J for a year, collaborating with The Majesty and other projects. Music is the most effective medium extent for the communication of emotion and the deepest expression of the essence of culture. Manipulation or outright destruction of a culture's music has therefore been one of the primary strategies of imperial domination. Western music has at times been particularly concerned with the nullification of anything unstructured, Quote, sexually open, quote-unquote savage, quote-unquote uncivilized, or otherwise concerned with the joy of life, or which speaks to the quote-unquote old parts of the brain. Genesis Briar Peorge's mentor, Brian Jason, confronted with the horror of Western cultural and ontological hegemony with a friend visiting him in Morocco, tuned a radio to a classical station, tellingly snapped at him to shut it off immediately, shouting it was too white. While involved in the Coombe Transmissions Performance Art Collective in the mail art scene in the early 1970s, Peorage created collages with the phrase E. Hate Stockhausen repeated over and over. The mission statement of Throbbing Gristle was to create anti music and disrupt the control frequencies of civilization by any means necessary. The lessons of TG were reincorporated within Psychic TV and increasingly oriented towards producing transcendental bliss. The m master musicians of Juka provided a template, but it wasn't until 1988 
Let the stars align for Pan, god of panic, to sound his cry across the world. The initiates of the Temple of Psychic Youth, weaned on Jujuka and the Dream Machine, had already habituated themselves to the states of mind that would be produced en masse by Acid House, Ecstasy, and computer-generated rave visuals, and became the vanguard of this new eruption of delirium. Hence would Beau Jaloud, Pan Baphomet, be shepherded into public view yet again, and the mask of control slip, just slightly, for a f- brief few years for a whole generation. By the time the criminal, ju- criminal justice bill was passed in the UK, effectively outlawing raves, the man behind the curtain had already been revealed, control sliced up as if by Burroughs' expertly targeted scissors. Throughout its 11-year lifespan, T.O.P.Y. aimed to transgress against church, state, the nuclear family, and reality itself. Of course, transgression against modern culture is often quick quickly short-circuited, since culture will sooner or later get round t- to assimilating its opposition by mass-producing a watered-down facsimile. Not that the authorities take this macro-cultural mechanism into account when dealing with the vanguard of such innovation. Consider the current mass popularity of body piercing, introduced to T.O.P.Y. by Alan Oversby, a.k.a. Mr. Sebastian, a former art teacher who had left his position to promote tattooing and piercing in the gay leather and BDSM community in London. That was one of many phenomena that T.O.P.Y. culturally engineered the wider acceptance of. Body piercing is now an adolescent mandate, yet in 1987, Mr. Sebastian, who provided the vocals on A Message from the Temple, a track on Force the Hand of Chance, that was the initial open call to affirmation with the temple, was arrested in the U.K. government raid known as Project Spanner, along with 15 other men from the BDSM community. He was subsequently charged with assault with actual bodily harm for consensually placing a man's penis as well as using anesthetic without a license, consensually piercing a man's penis, as well as using anesthetic without a license and sending obscene material, piercing photos, through the mail. This is now a service that is available at relatively low cost in every metropolitan area in the Western world. In 1987, though, Mr. Sebastian was considered a threat to society and was sentenced to 15 years, later suspended to two years. His profession and life were destroyed. He died heartbroken in 1996. Operation Spanner was only one tragedy of many in a very bleak English political climate. Wars of imperial futility in the Falklands and Libya, nuclear gridlock, proposed concentration camps for AIDS patients, crackdowns on alternative cultures of all shapes and sizes, constant bloodshed over Ireland, environmental degradation, economic hell. America, with the resurgence of the religious right, secret wars, CIA-supported dictators, socially engineered crack panic, and mutually assured destruction was hardly better. The 80s cower before me in our base. Alistair Crowley prophesied in the Book of the Law, speaking for the Egyptian warrior god Rahur Kuit. In such a climate, T.O.P.Y. was first and foremost a survival strategy. If it were to survive in in Margaret Thatcher's England, much as in Ronald Reagan's or verily George W. Bush's America, magic had to defend itself. If, as Mrs. Thatcher famously quipped to Women's Own magazine, there is no such thing as society, then the temple sought to prove her wrong ex nihilo, both in the UK and abroad. The tribal mindset present in both punk and later rave was refined in T.O.P.Y.'s a cultural laboratory, providing, for better or worse, a sense of family, belonging, commitment, and self-expression, where previously there had been none. Along with direct predecessors Alistair Crowley and Timothy Leary, Genesis Briar Peorage ranks as one of the magic's greatest propagandists, which he had been alternately deified and reviled for, much as Crowley and Leary were. The British authorities and tabloid press were not the only forces with which Genesis and T.O.P.Y. had to contend. Another was the occult establishment, or rather the, quote, Museum of Magic, as Genesis calls them, who were hardly pleased with the mainstreaming of what was previously considered dangerous and certainly privileged information. The Ordo Templi Orientis, or OTO, a Masonic body founded in German, Germany in the late 19th century and later captained and reformulated by Aleister Crowley in the early 20th, can be considered the clearest precedent to T.O.P.Y., a secret society created as an access point into the world of magic. Neither the OTO nor T.O.P.Y. were teaching orders, existing instead to foster socialization around occult ideas, halfway points for those interested in the hidden undercurrents of reality, training wheels that, when eventually discarded, would lead the individual either towards more abstruse orders of robed ritualists, or preferably, onto their own two feet and their own personal apotheosis. 
Such organizations have been running theme in Western history. As one slides into internal fighting and decay, another rises to take its place. Genesis has often related to me that during T.O.P.Y.'s heyday, Hymenius Beta, then and current outer head of the Caliphate O.T.O., felt that T.O.P.Y. was truly representing and doing the work of the active current that the O.T.O. had mined in the early half of the century, whereas his current job as the O.T.O. was more akin to that of a museum curator. The story of T.O.P.Y.'s last days is, of course, central to the myth it has left. By the early 1990s, the group had grown to a strength of nearly 10,000 connected, if not necessarily active, individuals across the globe. In February 1992, Genesis Briar Peorage was notified by Telegram. Telegram. The Peorage family were in Kathmandu, Nepal, at the time using their PTV income and donations from the wider TOPY network to feed and clothe Tibetan refugees, beggars, and lepers, sometimes as many as 300 daily that his home and T.O.P.Y. station had been raided by Scotland Yard in connection with a trumped-up satanic abuse charge. On the back of an old psychic TV video done earl years earlier by Derek Jarman for Channel 4, ironically the same channel now alleging the abuse, Peorage and T.O.P.Y. were accused of chaining women in the basement of the house in Brighton, impregnating the women, aborting the fetuses, and then forcing them to eat the remains. This is ironic for two reasons, the first being that the same story has been regularly used since the 4th century to smash pagan groups, since Epiphanius of Salimus accused the Barbarite Gnostic sect of the same crime, the second being that Genesis Peorage didn't even have a basement. After choosing exile in California instead of returning to England, where the public was already crying for blood from the scapegoat of the weak, Jen made the decision to dissolve T.O.P.Y., issuing a final publication, The Green Book, reprinted for the first time in this book, and a postcard reading simply, Changed Priorities Ahead. It had become obvious that T.O.P.Y.'s moment was over, that the mission, which had only ever been meant as a temporary experiment, was over. It had only been here to go, though some splinter groups remained and remain intact, continuing to use the T.O.P.Y. name and logo, the current moved on, leaving what amount to more displays in the Museum of Magic. As T.O.P.Y. was ending, a new world of digital media and cyber culture was being born, one that T.O.P.Y. had acted as a midwife for. The ritual now complete, the temple was banished. While Psychic TV dissolved along with T.O.P.Y. in the early 1990s, it would go on to reincarnate for the Larry Thrasher-produced Trip Reset and later in its current touring lineup as PTV3. Baba Larigi also features in the expanded poetry project co-founded with Brian Dahl, The Majesty. Fifteen years on, we are left with an occult landscape that has been given its shape and direction by the temple, whether it is publicly acknowledged or not. The vital current, of course, has mutated and evolved once again, not into a physical order this time, but into dispersal across the World Wide Web and mass publishing. While this provides for an incredibly unique period of open access to occult information, one can hardly help but long for the immediacy and community of a physical network, in contrast to the endless flame wars, constant degradation of information quality, and terminal loss of context that are the Internet's stock and trade. The TOPY years represented a period in which magic was resituated in its natural context as a survival mechanism in the urban blight of modern civilization, just as it was in the dark forests of pre-civilization. Though there may be nothing here now but the recordings, the recordings are there for all to see, to learn from, and to approve upon. This is one story of the temple, in one world, in one place in time. The names and details change each time it recreates itself anew. It learns, it processes, it incorporates, and evolves, thickens its own plot. My story is there for all to read, etched in genetic spirals along its supporting columns. Yours is too. Remember this. Remember Earth from space. Sun goes round as we breathe as one. Human totality breathes in, breathes out. Cars and electric lights, birth and death, sex, disease, running through the long grass at dawn, walking the ox across the steep mountain path, loading the Kalashnikov, spinning the prayer wheels at dusk, laying the child in the grave, singing the old songs. Listen to the sound of our breath from space, a secret name of the divine, the name of a ritual in which we must all take part. A temple space in which we are all assigned office. The office which you remember when you are. The temple is eternal, shimmering on the horizon. It is a ghost. 
It is the specter that answers us at the seance of our most secret desires. There is one process, and there are many processes. Jason Louv, Vancouver and New York City, Vancouver and New York City, 2006 era vulgaris.